morning and welcome to your daily game face. I am Dr. Kim Lan and I'm here with the illustrious Lou Blasi. <laughs> you realize our personalities are converging as we go along here. Uh, you are more I, like me this morning than I what? You are more like me this morning. Oh yeah, with my commentary when I came in but, the door. Yeah, just in general. Just in general. General well, attitude. That's because, and I won't cause us any trouble. I'm actually watching the screen last uh, because last week I got feedback that you could see up my nose, so I had to move. <laughs> so anyway, um, it, I the camera, just, as you can see, is just about nose level. I know I see it, but yeah. I wasn't paying attention to that because I wasn't being vain. And but people they're <laughs> watching me, so they can see up my nose. Jeez. So I'm making sure you can't see up my nose. <laughs> anyway, I came in this morning, and I. Can, I, I've been up at Plum Island. Now, for anyone that hasn't listened to Oh, we're going to go into podcast, this on the air. Uh, what? You said you, you, you were going to go into this on the <laughs> well, air. Well, I'm not going to go into it completely, but I okay, was up yeah. at Plum, Plum Island. Yeah. And, and, um, I think I your guy this, just likes the attention, by the and way. And I got the snowy again because yeah. he has not left. No, I think he just likes the attention. And, well, you know, he's so far away to give him the attention that everyone thinks he's getting. I mean, he'd have to, you know, I mean, he's like two football fields away. I mean, but he sits there for hours, literally hours, hours and I know. faces the camera. Yes, he does. Yeah. Did you see my pictures? I saw the I saw your pictures. They were good this weekend, huh? Yeah, they were very good. <laughs> he's been there for like 5 days now. I know. So, yeah. and he's enjoying it. Yeah. So, anyway, so off air, I told you that I would tell you some of the stories of the weekend cuz I won't do it cuz on air because it will probably <laughs> Get you in trouble, and it certainly will cause me something, I'm sure. Yeah. So, But nonetheless, the snow is there, and, and there are flocks of people going to yeah. um, photograph the snowy. Um, and the snowy owl, he's very pretty, but he's not supposed to be here. And apparently he is supposed to be here. They do last through to, like, May, but it is getting warmer. Yeah. So when I was taking pictures of him for the multiple hours I was sitting there on Mother's Day, um, it was hot. It was, like, 70 degrees out, and he was panting. Yeah. That's and a word that I have never heard used panting. with owls before. That he was panting? An owl panting? Have you ever heard an owl referred to as panting before? Well, before this incident? No, because I didn't know that they would pant, but they do. See the I new restaurant it. that's going up. That should be the name of the restaurant. The, owl the panting pant? owl. Oh my god, see? Yeah. <laughs> Is that the one on the corner? Yeah. Oh good. Yeah. Another one, by the way, which is probably a good example of what you're going going to say probably about the people of Newburyport, because I wasn't As you can imagine, anything that's about. kicked up some dust. I'm sure it yeah. has. I'm sure. Um, so, anyway, so I had a lovely Mother's Day weekend. I um, had the snowy owl, and that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then there were a whole bunch of other beautiful birds I got to take pictures of because I have now, you know, seek out all kinds of rare, strange birds to go photograph with. <laughs> and now I'm obsessed with getting a new lens that has to be bigger and longer and better than the 15 other people that are around me because I'm jealous. <laughs> So, you know, this is yeah. my competitive side, as you know, I have, hence being a sport and clinical psychologist. By the way, there were two people yesterday yes. that were there for as long as the snowy owl was. Like, I'm, oh, sure. I'm leaving the island and they're sitting there with yes. their cameras pointed. Yes. And I come back and they're sitting there and the owl's still sitting there. And, yes. Yeah. Because you can only take 500,000 pictures, <laughs> which I actually filled my camera this weekend and had to stop because I ran out of space. But I, I mean, so, it's an owl. It's not like it's owl. doing yoga or anything. Oh, you, <laughs> blasphemy. <laughs> blasphemy. It's like you could sit and take, I could take the same picture of the same moose for hours. When you see your moose, you're going to well, be like. at least the moose moves. Sometimes. Owl just sits there and pants you. <laughs> 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 anyway, so yes. along, uh, moving along, it was a very nice weekend up here in Massachusetts, or at least in our neck of the woods. And relatively speaking, and yes, and um, it was uh, lovely weather, and it was a very nice day. And and then remember how we were talking about hypothyroid and whatever, and my yep. cats. So my cats went in for their hyperthyroid removal with radioactive iodine I one thirty one on Monday. They had their thyroid had them, removed. There is actually a cure. For hypothyroid, hyper, not hypo, hyperthyroid in cats and felines. These hmm. amazing scientists came up with this better part of 20 years ago. And, you know, of course it's expensive because, you know, I have to own a wing in some hospital somewhere at all times. And so, and they inject it. It's a quick, easy thing, but they have to stay there in the hospital for a couple of days. Okay. And they're coming home today. Nice. Congratulations. And I think that that's because the, the tech who I was just on the phone with inside the car waiting to come in here when I was running late because of that was like, I think that they should go home because they're not eating. Because <laughs> they're very, you know, yeah. neurotic 
yeah, sure. Because they're mine. They're just and, freaked out. Yes. So yeah. so they're coming home today. And it's very specific. You can't come at 9. You can't come at 12. You must come between 4.30 and 6.30. And it's only at the specified time because wow. they hand off the radioactive children to you and, and say goodbye. <laughs> Do they have yeah. hazmat suits on? Or? Apparently. Yeah. So, well, the instructions that come with Radio Cat, that's what it's called, are it's like an indemnity clause of signing your life away because it is radioactive and you have to have special yeah. litter and you have to throw it down the toilet. You can't throw it out. You have to make sure that you have septic versus sewer. If you have sewer, you have to make sure the town knows because they have to alert the CDC. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> This is always a process. Really? Yes. Doesn't you know, DuPont make a bag that you can <laughs> put this thing in and toss it with the regular trash? I, I should contact DuPont and say, yeah. hey, we've got a million bajillion dollar deal here. <laughs> anyway. Do you ever wonder about people to the extent that I do? What, yeah. what was the thought? What do I do for a living? I know. <laughs> really? You're asking me this question? What do no. I do for a living? I think about this daily thousands of times no but my first thought when you talked about someone coming up with a cure for a cat hyperthyroidism mm -hmm. I, I tried to picture the guy or woman could have been a woman the guy the person who decided one day you know what i'm going to cure this damn thing yeah and then went out and raised some money to cure a cat hypothyroidism and then did all this research and actually came up with something yes isn't it amazing what was going on in their lives that <laughs> I, I do know the story and the backstory of it, but of oh, course I forgot <laughs> what it is. But I, it was related somehow to their veterinarians, obviously, and they were very. Yeah. There was something that was going on. I think in one of the one of them, there were two researchers. One of them had a cat that had and had passed away, and they couldn't do anything about it. You know, kind Probably, of the general, yeah. you know, sad story of like you know loss and. And then what uh, was the reaction in the room at the point where they decided to go radioactive? Uh, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Everyone lit up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that goes my second guy theory. Have I ever told you the second guy theory? No. Uh, do you remember the plane that the landing gear wouldn't come down? Yes. So they drove a pickup truck yes. under the plane, and yes. the guy stood in the back of the pickup truck and pulled the landing gear yes, down? Yes, I do remember that. That was the beginning of my second guy theory. Uh-huh. Because there's a guy in the room yes. who came up with this idea. Yes. And God bless him. Yes. He's, he's a great American. I, I love the first guy in the room. But... None of this ever happens without the second guy in the room who goes, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, yes. The, the second, second guy is more crucial than the first guy. That's right, because you have to have validation. Right, because See? that first guy says, let's stand up in the back of a pickup truck driving underneath a flying plane, and the Coming guy will reach up you. and pull it down. Yeah. <laughs> and every, normal people would go, what are you, out of your mind? Well, you know. But there was that one heroic second guy in the room who said, that's a good idea. And that's the whole premise of Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise. So then that guy said, let's, radio let's use radioactivity on these cats. And there had to be a second guy in the room who said, that's a good idea. Yes. I, and there were two. So mm -hmm. clearly they agreed with each other. Very yeah. good. I like that second guy theory. Yeah. We'll have to talk more about that. Nothing happens in America without the second guy. <sighs> There's so many things I could say. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, so a little slap happy this morning. I am currently drinking for all that you, okay, all of the people that care. It is a Dunkin' Donuts official, not home grown mm -hmm. today. It is Dunkin' Donuts iced coconut. I think iced coconut today. Iced coconut coffee. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Because it's a beautiful day. It's still windy. If you're living here in Massachusetts. In the past week, it feels like we are in a constant wind tunnel. Yep. Like, don't you feel like we're just going to blow right into the ocean? <laughs> I can't tell the difference where I am. It's oh, always like that. I know. It's always yeah. like that. You, you, It was really windy up there yeah. this weekend. Um, I'm just going to get a house and move in next to you. Okay. And then, right, so it'll be all good. This I was going to come stalk you this weekend. Several around. <laughs> so, so. You can move into my shed. Yeah. I'm all set. <laughs> I've heard about your shed. I'm all set. I'm good. <laughs> I've heard about that shed. Yeah. I'm good. That's so true. anyway, yeah. so so many things to talk about because there's so much going on in the world and people's lives and changes and fast stuff and and people had lots of feedback from the last couple of shows and so Oh really? So I have good. great feedback and yeah. interesting questions and people asking advice afterwards and people calling and asking to do more on some of those things. So instead of doing like one specific topic today i thought okay. we would do a little bit of a bounce around some of the questions i got and it's kind of a mailbag yeah kind of. and so yeah. and so one of the questions i had gotten around anxiety and hyper and hypothyroidism from a show a couple times ago was like what you know people always, people always want to know what can you take yeah 
Yeah, exactly. So bypass all the other advice I've given. Yep. But what can you take to make it feel better? So, and it's natural. So one of my go-tos of late is in the past couple of years, because it's natural and holistic and whatever, is we have, I'm going to give a little science background on this first. We have the what we call the endocannabinoid system, the ECS. Mm-hmm. Big words, right? Yeah. The endocannabinoid system system, which is basically, we have receptors in our I took that to Sully Square (laughs) (laughs) last summer. We have have two sets of receptors in our body brain to accept CBD, the cannabinoid. Oh, okay. Right? And they convert them in different ways. But the endocannabinoid system, which is in the brain and, you know, and it accepts the cannabinoid portion of marijuana mm-hmm. not to be mistaken with marijuana that is the thc right part of it which is the part that gets you zipping or happy or euphoric or all those pieces that give you the high the other side of it which is the cannabinoid the cbd the cannabinoid oil that comes from hemp and and marijuana plants it actually can help with internal inflammation and anxiety systems. And why is that? Because in the ECS system, we I've talked about this before, we have the amygdala, which is yep. like your fight or flight response, or your hippocampus, which is your memory bank, essentially, I'm giving short versions of this, yep. and your hypothalamus, which is your regulator for your temperature, sex, thirst, hunger, and all those things. But the specific one around the ECS system for this is that the amygdala, the fight or flight, will generate a stress response when we're threat generating or we're anxious or so on and so forth. And what the research has found in more than 500 years worth of research, actually, like in various ways over time and whatever to to deal with, you know, the use of these parts of this plant um, has come to find even most recently as in the past few months in a couple of different great journals that are very reputable is that the the CBD that you can take that's at a, you know, that's pure, that's not like you know, mixed in with all the other things that they put in to sell it and say, here's, you know, $500 for this piece and there's not hardly anything. Like pure yeah. CBD, good tincture oil or a good, you know, supplement, whatever, will actually go to the ECS system and help lower the stress response that's been generated in the amygdala and allow your body to relax around that, which is also a secondary gain or it could be the primary, depending on yeah. who, what you're using it for, to let the body itself have a, a de-inflammation process. So that was an answer to a question. A couple of people asked me different things. And that was one of the best things that I feel is easily taken in terms of natural. It's not addictive. There's no, you can't test positive for marijuana in it. Right. Which people are always like, oh, it's marijuana. No, it's not. It has nothing. It's nothing the same. Because um, people get all freaked out about that. Yeah. And it's not. And that... Um, it's easily metabolized. It doesn't cause long-term effects. That you know, it's like you know, it's like have some green tea kind of thing. Like yeah. it's, it's very soothing. It's natural. It's no issue. So, and I'm always going towards things like that versus other things that you can get over the counter that people would say, oh, you can have that. But then you know, like people often use like Benadryl, and I did talk about Benadryl. Yeah. Benadryl's great for quick fix, but it has. You can't use that long term. It gives you lots of other side effects, and it makes you sleepy, and it, you can't drive a car during. You know. Yeah. I mean, and people want to use that, but it is the, what it is. Is this different from the CBD oil that you would get on in CBD oil storefronts and in your favorite CVS and Walgreens? Um. So, so there is a difference. And good morning. I just was reading comments for everyone that was watching. Um, because I just put my glasses on because I can't see because I'm blind as a bat. Um. <laughs> The CBD oil is different from place to place depending on brand. So what I've found, there's been a huge surge of CBD in the past year, especially because it seems like the pandemic has allowed everyone to make their products. Like I can actually make a product and stick a label on it and manufacture it. That's how easy it is. Um, But the CBD creams or tinctures or edibles that you can get that are really pure... You're going to find them more in Whole Foods, natural, holistic stores, the vitamin shop, Mm -hmm. because they're getting the higher end brands, which are not always more expensive. They're the ones that have the more milligrams or the more micrograms of CBD purely in the product versus the fillers. So when you're looking for something like that, look to see what the fillers are inside. And they don't, because it's not FDA regulated because it's a natural product. It doesn't have to list. Right. 
all of that stuff, but <laughs> there is one that you can get. There is one now that I see that has come into CVS. I haven't seen it in Walgreens, but I've seen it in CVS. That's there's a like a row that now has like all these different things. And there's one brand which I can't think of off the top of my head that actually is pretty reputable. Mm-hmm. But the main one, and I don't get paid for this, the main <laughs> one that actually started the whole thing to my knowledge in the country about like putting all these products out is down in Key West, Florida. There's a, a pharmacist. She created the CBD products that really kind of started the whole push for this. Yeah. And it's called Green Roads. And they're expensive, but you know you're getting, when it says a thousand milligrams of like the roll on with the menthol, you're getting a thousand milligrams of that with the menthol as a side. So you're looking for things that are really pure in product and you're going to find them more in the natural whole food stores and like the whole, right. not just whole foods, but the whole food kind of places. So, you know, not necessarily Rite Aid. I mean, everybody's putting them out there. If you go into the little kiosks at the mall, there's actually CBD medic. And I think that's the one that Rob Gronkowski was promoting. That one actually is really good as well. And it mm-hmm. has good high ratings. I have not personally used it, but I have clients that have, and they swear by it. Um, you can also go into, in Massachusetts here, we have dispensaries cause it's legal to have THC. The dispensaries actually, sell therapeutic level CBD that you can get straight like that. It's expensive, but it works. But they also have it with like a 0.01% of THC in it. And THC doesn't cross over the skin barrier, so it doesn't go into you. So you would never test positive for marijuana unless you're using a transdermal patch, which they have those as well. So if you're worried about using... um, THC, Anything with THC, you're gonna yeah. right. Then don't do transdermal patches, but you can use creams that have it. And the reason why people will go towards the THC portion of it, like the one percent piece of it, is because that adds a little extra boost of of um, um, calming skin right. or calming down the area because of the natural concept of you know it does inside the body what it would do outside the body when you when you take it orally. So um, so there's but you can only get those inside the dispensaries. If you go to a dispensary and you don't have an issue going to a dispensary, you can just get pure CBD products without any THC, and that would probably be your best bet um, if you don't know what you're doing out in the world like at Walgreens and CVS. Pardon me if this is off topic or too far into the woods, but I own, a, I, own a, I own an Australian Shepherd, and I've had the thought from time and time again, a little CBD in the water might calm him down a little bit. So I'm all for it. A lot of veterinarians are for it. I'm not a veterinarian, but mm-hmm. if but I have used it with my cats. I've used it with um, my clients recommended for like some of their dogs. They've gone to their vet. My vet recommends it. So I know that plenty of people out there are using it for their animals. You have to be really careful. Again, the products, there's very specific products that have been made for cats. There's ones that have been made for dogs because of weight. You have to be careful. Like it's dosing because it can, yep. you know, sure. take, you know, we can, we can take a whole bottle apparently. <laughs> It'll be fine. But, um, yeah, so you can put it in their food. There's little tinctures, there's little powders, there's all kinds of stuff. So, um, again, um, uh, most vet, I think there's one veterinarian around here that actually sells it, but this is an, a little interesting caveat about CBD. The insurance, because I was going to actually sell some of it two years ago and start like doing it from green roads or whatever, this, the insurance to carry on the liability is astronomical. I can imagine. So yeah. because of the liability, not because there's actually any high risk to it, which colleagues and myself have had this conversation. It's more that the perception of the liability of, this, of, the, of the stigma that comes with it, that people automatically go, oh, it's marijuana. And so... So it's easier just not to deal with that. And I just say, here's recommendations of the seven things you could possibly try to make it feel better. And so people go out and make their own choices and talk to their primary cares about it. So, Are there any conditions that would disqualify an animal? Like, And I wasn't prepared for this, so I, didn't, I don't have the acronym nailed down. But he's tested positive. Is it MSDR1? Yep. Yeah. 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 I, so I, I wouldn't know that that would be something I would definitely check because I'm, sh- I, I mean, in humans, there are certain conditions you have to be careful with CBD, especially if you're taking other medications. Um, so I would check, I don't know that, Yeah. but you know, uh, a good holistic vet would know that for sure. I don't know if you're a vet. A lot of people don't yeah. know it, but you can find someone to reach out and they would certainly tell you. And there's so many good resources out there for that. So, um, 
but there are certainly pre-existing conditions or existing conditions yeah. that would certainly preclude somebody or a dog or a cat from having it. But I, they use it in horses a lot. Yeah, they use a lot of stuff in horses, yeah. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. As of the Kentucky Derby, we yeah. now know, right? Um, I tried CBD oil for a while, and it was mostly out of a curiosity, you know, with anxiety. Plus, I was going to my chiropractor at that point because I had to have something right. straightened out. Yeah. And she was she's a kind of holistic too so she's got a lot of stuff going on mm -hmm. and she had it there so i talked to her about it she gave me some i can't say i really saw much of a reaction or much of a difference mm. so, i mean it could be it could be tr try different products try different it could yeah. be a product i mean yeah. i have a couple that i can tell you about off air that are work beautifully because yeah. i had when i broke my arm back when i was eight years old i broke this finger my pinky finger at the same time they didn't know that my arm was a little bit more of a problem because I had a compound fracture and oh, almost lost it. God. So, you know, yeah. save the finger, save the arm. Um, but my uh, finger now, because I'm older, um, gets a little arthritis in it yep. So in the winter. So I just rub this particular brand on, and like in 10 minutes, it's <laughs> fine. And it works beautifully. So. Nice. Because it used to get really painful and... Uh, so now I don't have that issue because I have that cream. So yeah. hopefully it will keep working. Um, or I wasn't doing a topical. I was doing an ingesting. Oh, you were ingesting. ingesting. And that's the same thing. Like, yeah. there's some products that I, I've i had clients try, and they're like, ah, that didn't work. And then they'll go. And that's the other thing. Because it's not regulated, unless you have a really reputable company that's consistently knowing how to make it, the, yeah. it will say 1,000 milligrams, but you could be getting 50. Right. I mean, so that's why I'm, I'm saying be cautionary when you go to find a product. Make sure you go to a place that has, uh, you know, that they actually are measuring. They're actually doing, they're not just saying 100%, yeah, 100% of the 1% that's in yeah. it. And so, and be consumer smart about that because there are so many yucky products out mm -hmm. there. Hey, really quick question. There's someone that asked between the difference between anxiety and anxiousness online today. Um, great question. Yeah. Is there a difference? Well, I mean, certainly um, anxiousness is a state of being in anxiety. So anxiety, in, if we look at that question as a general umbrella question, is that anxiety is, you know, it has a couple different answers, but anxiety is the fear of, of the unknown. It's a threat generation in our minds of what ifs, should haves, and could haves, and would haves, and maybes, and, and all those things. But anxiety physiologically is the internal body giving an alert system to run, to freeze, to do something to protect yep. itself, right? So across the board. Anxiousness is a symptom. So an anxiousness is jittery, stomach ache butterflies sweaty palms yep. um it could be a headache it could be dizziness so anxiousness is like a symptom spectrum of anxiety that would be <laughs> yeah what i would consider because an anxiousness is just the state of being in anxiety and so if someone's having performance anxiety versus you know um anxiety of an upcoming surgery or right. um, a test today. So the state of anxiousness is going to be different for different people. But the overall thing would be like if someone was going to describe they say, I'm anxious and I have anxiety. So kind of interchangeable, but yep. clear delineations. But it's possible to have anxiety without clear physical manifestations, yes. right? Yes. It can Some be people a, do. Yeah can be a more of a mental state, but yes. anxiousness is one of the ways that comes out physiologically. Right. So, yeah. uh, so that's, that's, you know, it's a state of being and then versus like when people have mental anxiety, it's the worry, it's the meta worry, worry about worry about worry. Yeah. And then the worry, I see this a lot in my practice is that people will have lots of meta worry and not realize that it's physically impacting them. So, yeah. you know, you know, we know it creates heart disease, cardiovascular issues, breathing issues, it can increase diabetes problems, it can increase weight gain. It can, uh, so like any chronic need, condition, the uh, damage can be subtle and accumulate over time. Right. Yeah, exactly. So so if a person stays in their outside of their self observing ego or their self observing, right, yeah. ability to be self aware. Yeah. And they just keep going through life wondering like, well, why is this happening? Or I have these chest pains or, but they don't relate them. 
Right. I, I can't tell you how many times over the years of my practice that I've said, yeah, that's related. And I'm like, oh, no, yes. And then when I do the whole story out of like how, then it's aha moment of. Do you find people aren't aware they're suffering from anxiety just because it's the water that they swim in? It's the, it's. Many people. Yeah. Right. Many people that I, like, especially when. No, someone, that's just life. That's someone just sends me yeah. someone, you know, like a primary care physician will send me someone. Um, or like I, I work with a dermatologist. She sends me people all the time that have a medical condition, but she sends them to me unbeknownst to them. The reason why they're coming, cause they'll come in and say, I don't know why I'm seeing you, but you know, Dr. Jen said, yep. come see you. And, um, it's because the condition, you know, their acne, their psoriasis, their dermatitis, their, whatever it is, is because there's an underlying anxiety or underlying stress that's creating a histamine in dermatological issues, a histamine in the body. Interesting. It's creating the, the problem usually. So being able to explain that and kind of keep working on that and give techniques around how to manage that is usually what happens. But people will come in and say, I have no idea why, the, the, how this is connected. Because as much as we have trended towards being mind, body, spirit connected, um, and everyone talks the buzzwords of meditate and be mindful and all that, yeah. people talk the talk but don't actually walk the walk. So when you actually break it down and, and you say, but your brain's talking to your body all the time and your body's talking to your brain and <laughs> they can't work separately. They work together, even if you're not aware of it or conscious of it. Um, and sometimes that aha moment is quite striking for people. I love, I love that the whole thing. Now you see these memes put up, the, all these spiritual memes, and it's like, yeah. man, do you read what you post? <laughs> <laughs> because you don't live what you post. Mm. <laughs> you know, you're not that person. Let's yes. let's talk about anxiety um, from the standpoint of our survival, our primitive nature. Yes has to put us in a state of anxiety it's mm -hmm. required that's what i'm it's basically our mind's job right to keep us anxious well to keep us in to get well it's to keep us in survival mode to make sure that we stay away from the chasing pterodactyls and the and the lions and the <laughs> yeah. saber-toothed tigers but, but to go back to my favorite your mind to, is you're you're a survivor people always thought there was a bear in the back of the cave exactly always because those who didn't get killed got killed exactly because right. you weren't anticipating right and so so that's the amygdala that's the fight or flight part of the system that we're always in the ability to be in the adapting state of anxiety yeah. to but we're evolutionary descendants of people who are hyper at that right 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 that's just our nature so this is an impossible question to answer but i'll oh. throw it anyway what is the correct level of anxiety that you carry around and how do you know when anxiety is a answer. problem you have the answer i do have okay. the answer so the benefit of being a sports psychology person mm -hmm. is that so we've done great research around that question yeah. and so <clears throat> it's called the inverted u theory Ooh, interesting the inverted u see you thought you were going to stump me on this so no i thought i was putting you in a bad position oh actually. no yeah. oh no i love yeah. good questions like this so the inverted you is basically that you know imagine if you have the you know your x and y axis and yep. you have the u upside down mm -hmm. right and a bell so, curve sort of what? a bell curve so. yeah a bell curve right yeah. so inverted you for the the benefit of the sports people yeah um but w what we look at is we look at perform you know performance level either good mediocre or right. bad poor and level of anxiety right so we know so what we've seen and it comes out every single time is that and it's going to be obvious when i say this is that the inverted u part right in the center mm -hmm. is the anxiety where the anxiety needs to be to be at your optimal level for best performance of whatever whether it's athleticism business being life life right yeah. When you have none, like when, you know, I always say this to my students, I'm like, if you come into this exam and you're that confident, you have no anxiety, you're not going to do as well as if you had some. Right. And then for people that come in, you know, over the top, cocky, I'm awesome, I got it covered and I've studied, right? They too will fall. So they'll be the outliers. They'll be at the bottoms of the right. U that are sitting on that plane. Whereas the people that are fluctuating right in that bell curve middle are the ones that, have the appropriate level now ask me to tell you what that level right. looks like well that's different for each person so some people are very calm cool and collected with a little bit of anxiety and another person can be like off the wall and then on the day of can be falling right in that middle because they know how to modulate it right. so it's very so i can't so answer the, that it's the point of diminished returns right finding the point of diminished returns and athletes are tuned up before a contest to create a certain level of anxiety 
they're, they're aimed at that. So when you have, so, so it's interesting because I, I have the benefit of having, you know, working with like recreational little kids all the way up through to elite level and pro athletes. And you see a difference and you see the, the gradation go up of like, you know, when people yeah. are really starting out new and they're super anxious and, and you can see as they get better skills and they get better along the way and they're more resilient because there is a resiliency factor to building this inverted sure. U space yep. that by the time that they are elite level or pro level or top ranking high school or, you know, division one, two or three, like top athletes, there's usually a commonality of that piece of their that they sit in the inverted U here. It's very rare that the outliers make it into those right. states because the character, the internal state of anxiety, the management, the resiliency, the strength, the confidence, all those pieces have grown to the place where they can come into that. And, you know, many, many people say, oh, it's been it's natural in them. Most athletes that I've talked to will say that they've had to work at that. That that's it's natural on some level, but there's a lot of no, work you, to go into. You put that. it the right way. Yeah. Good athletes, and this is why I always used to laugh when I started getting into this in my personal life. It's like I had all these things as an athlete. I had all these principles as an athlete. Could never apply them in personal life, but an athlete um, learns to modulate. Right. That's what they do. They 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 ramp themselves up. And they learn the point where it starts to diminish their performance. Exactly. And try to avoid it. This is why I bill all the time everything in campus competition. Right. It's, it's the very thing of keeping anxiety going. Right. Well, yeah. right, because you're always practicing it. You're always yeah. getting, you're always honing the skill of being able to be anxious but still perform with your best inverted you performance. Right. And that's, you, you see when people come in off their game or you see, you know, using the Patriots or. I call them the Tampa Bay Patriots. Hey. So <laughs> wherever wherever our team players are. We're done with that. We've moved right, on. The Tampa Bay Patriots. <laughs> yeah. um, you can see that when someone's off, then the team will suffer if they're like the ones that carry that resiliency. Yep. Or if you, you can see when they're on their game, the whole team comes with them. And it's it's a very fascinating study around like football and NFL <clears throat> teams. Tom. <laughs> yeah, Tom and and Rob because there's a belief well, system. Well, that's... Tom's Tom's um, attitude, Tom's attitude. You could see the whole franchise yeah. shift. You know the mm -hmm. effect that he had on the franchise in general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so that that's such an interesting. I hope that people are doing research out there because I we definitely all talk about it. I'm sure that someone's doing some kind of study on the 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 transferability from the Patriots over to the Buccaneers and how you know. Is it is it the common denominator of Tom? Is it the common denominator of Tom, Robert Kraft, and Bill Belichick? Is it, which I don't think it is. I think, you know, just looking and anecdotally watching that, that was a great set of people together, but Tom's over here creating it again. And, yeah. and here's and, he, and Bill Belichick's going to do it over here. He just picked a whole new... Well, Tom took the lessons and right. ported them. See, right. Yeah. So you've got this place with all the people at the Patriots doing that mindset of the inverted you, and now you're going to have it over here, likely. And then when Tom leaves, my prediction would be, you know, as a psychologist, that yeah. it's going to struggle because the culture won't be... I mean, t And Tom, it's funny how it, it, culture and this whole thing, because that's a great example, because he went to Tampa Bay, and Bruce Arians is, when we lose, we booze. Right. Which is an entirely different, different attitude right. set, and Tom just basically swamped that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and said, that's not... Yeah. That's not how we do things. <laughs> we don't do that. All right. So in everyday yes. life, yes. what what are the signs of the point of diminished returns? How do I identify where, all right, I got a problem with this? Well, okay. So well, that so that goes back to your first part of your question of like, yeah. when do you know it's not good? So yeah. when, the easy but not easy answer is that when it's impacting your functioning, are you financially struggling because of it? Are you missing work because of it? Are you now having, are you stopped eating? Some people do. Like, are you overeating? Are you socially isolating? Are you drinking more? Are, so it's going to be individual, yeah. but those are the time when you're going to see that there's, when it, functioning starts to change. It's kind of like when you hit addiction issues. Yeah, I was going to bring up addiction because it's kind of the same thing. So, yeah. so they, you know, and, and people always say this is all separate, but it's not. Everything kind of goes together because they're all related. It's just a yeah. matter of degree of, like, what what the problem is or the pathology of it is. If well, it addiction is a dual diagnosis is always right. a dual diagnosis right, right? And, and so when you have that oh, speaking of that uh, we'll talk about that a little bit but the um it's you know does the does the anxiety hold you hostage yeah so like addiction addiction holds people emotionally hostage 
So anxiety, when it holds you emotionally hostage and you're fighting it versus I right. always tell people to go with it, flow with it. Don't fight it. Let it ride. And people always give me that like look of like, what are you talking about? Because it goes counter to the culture of problem versus solution. The solution is not to fight. The solution is to accept it and go with it. It's about, okay, treat not anxiety. Treat the moment, which is it's here. I have anxiety. I get anxiety. I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Versus people who I have a great example in the past couple of weeks, I've got a client that really struggles with anxiety and all of a sudden, you know, you, you see them forever, like three, four years and all of a sudden they have an aha moment. I, it's whatever I did to phrase it a little differently this yeah. time. But all of a sudden he had a shift to finally understand that go with the flow, ride it. I give him the example of riding it down the river, imagining that when I'm, Here's my here's my free freebie that I give in therapy is that I, I make people visualize, so everyone visualize out there that, you know, loosely, going up a river like a salmon. Salmon's trying to go up river to spawn and to, yeah. you know, right? The the success rate is hard. It's like yeah. you watch for you could watch that for hours and it's like, oh my god, these poor things, and then the bear comes along and gets you and you know, yep. right. So instead of so people who <laughs> back are back to the bear. Yeah, back to the bear. <laughs> yeah. So um I can see the tagline on my on my stuff. <laughs> the bear and the, the bear and the salmon. Yeah. Um but so when you visualize anxiety in people who are really struggling and don't have what you know control in in over it, right? Because people want control over it because that will make it better. They're on the edge of like, they're trying to swim upstream and they're fighting that current and they're dying on the bridge, essentially. They're dying right. on the waterfall because they can't get over it, which is what happens to the salmon. They don't get to spawn. They die yep. off, right? Instead, I tell people anxiety control, if that's the word, I hate that word, but anxiety management is not managing it, is giving into it in that moment and imagining yourself riding down the river and, and landing in a shallow pool that's safe and it's, there's no threat there because you yep. can visualize that you're just there. And that process of just being like, I'm just gonna ride this out, I'm gonna go with the flow, I'm gonna let it happen, and then it'll be over. What happens is, and this guy that I've been seeing for a long time about this, he's like panic mode. He's not having panic attacks anymore because he's not at that end of the stream trying to jump over to get up to spawn, right? right. He's, he's down in the bottom. So when he can visualize going down to the bottom, He's like, oh, my God, this is so much better. And that was the aha moment that he was um, threat generating. He wasn't being rational, realistic, and reasonable. He right. was trying to be, I can control this. And I'm like, how can you control it? Every time you think about it more and you start planning out for all the possibilities of the what ifs that are coming that never happen, you've just wasted two and a half hours and your heart's out of your chest. Right. And, and it's, so it's, you can either try to fight like the salmon or you can ride it down the stream and just be there and just chill until it passes. And now he's had the success and he's like, oh, this works, this works. But it's trusting. That's the other piece. It's trusting to go away from the thing you know. Yeah. To go to something new going, I'd rather struggle and try to jump up over the thing and struggle and suffer than, well, that might work. Well, it's how you deal with all those threats because if, right. if the threats that you're generating are existential right. in your mind, it's very hard to float downstream. Right. With that. So what you have to, initially what you have to do is understand that you're Thoughts are not necessarily real. S separate yourself from your thought process. Well, Those right. threats that you generate, how many of them are actually real? Well, and that's and that's part of the process too. Yeah. I mean, in, in the shortened version, I didn't say that, but you know, I often will say we are not our thoughts. Our and our thoughts are not our feelings. They are both valid, but they aren't necessarily reality. Right. And I never say they're not real because I, I always validate that you can have that thought, but there's no fact to back that up. What proof or evidence do you have? that that's really true and whatever the thing is. And the amount of pushback, especially when people are starting out doing this, it's it's cognitive behavioral therapy, sure. right? Yeah. So whenever people are starting to, you know, th there's lots of pushback because people will say, oh, I have evidence that it doesn't work. Or I have evidence that it's going to fail. And when I say, what is it? They have evidence, but the evidence isn't fact. The evidence is something that's speculative. It's sort it's projective. of projective. Projective. It's, yeah. it's it's not real. Mm -hmm. It's just well, it's a thought that might happen. And I'm like, well, that's not fact again. So and and then I get the yeah, but and I'm like, no, 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 yeah, but. <laughs> so, um, you know, so putting in real time of you know, like someone saying like. It, 
addiction is easier to use. So, uh, so you have someone that's in addiction and they're sober and they're working on their recovery and, you know, they have, you know, their, their brother or their sister's really mad at them for all the things that happened while they were using and whatever. And, you know, the, the, you know, for all intents and purposes, let's say that this relationship isn't at the end and no, and they didn't get cut off. Right. So there, but there's some damage there. So the person that's sitting in front of you with the addiction is saying, you know, I'm a failure. My sister hates me. Um, I, you know, w what evidence do you have? Well, because every time I'm around, she just looks angry at me. Okay. But did you ask her? Well, no. So you start yeah. going down the path of real, and she could be angry at you, but Instead of speculating the level of that to make your anxiety go up, which then triggers you to have another thought that has another feeling about being a failure or a disappointment to someone that will make you drink or drug or whatever the ism is, you have to start exploring and unraveling this so that you can repair yourself and heal yourself from the wounds. And people often, this is in any addiction or even depression or anxiety or any of the things we've been talking about, that you can get everything that's on the surface in control. Like you can stop drinking. Yeah. That doesn't make a person in recovery. You can stop being depressed, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get depressed again. What makes it happen is you have to do the healing from internal up out, not external. And people who have depression, anxiety, and addiction and other things like that are very externally driven of, well, this is happening to me versus, okay, I got this under control. Now I have to do the work on on fixing or, or healing from within to not have to worry about all these externals that might be pressing on me to make me feel this way. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's like the, the one, two, three steppers in the 12 step program of addiction. People will do one, two, three step, step one, two, one, two, and three. But by the time they get to the fourth and fifth, if everyone who out there doesn't know what I'm talking about, there's 12 steps in the 12 step program. Um, it's the big book. I think everyone in life should have the big book, whether you are an alcoholic or a drug addict or not, because it's a life lesson book, even mm -hmm. though it was written back in the day. It's so timely. I mean, there's some sexism in it now because people would go up in arms, but it just bypassed that because, you know, it was written back in the day. So, but it's so timely because when you look at each of the steps by the time you get to the fourth step is the work the fourth and fifth step in the big book are where you have to take a look inward and look at your character flaws your resentments the things that have happened that you've done to other people like giving a shortened version of this and yeah. then and then you got to work on figuring out how to forgive yourself and make amends to others yeah. i just squashed that all together but <laughs> but that's where the work is so when you're not doing a 12-step program but you're doing like recovery work from anxiety or depression or whatever it's not a, that's why pill just taking a pill that's great band-aid yeah but if you're not doing the work that helps you get down the river to the calm spot or you're not doing the work to understand why you're a threat generator or what it is about threat generating that keeps it happening or when did it start for you and how do you manage that whole toxic environment that creates the feeling of being down or whatever it is it's going to keep returning triple quadruple strength and as we get older if it's not treated people get worse it's funny how uh, the 12-step program for me the ir irony of it is is it works based on a higher power yes and eventually I don't know if any of everybody finds this out eventually, but the higher power is you. Right. right. That, yes, I was just going to say, yeah. oh, I hope you're going in the right, because yeah. the higher power... And it people... reminds me of, I grew up with the saying, because I was raised Catholic, and it, there was a saying that always stuck stuck with me, when you're young, you fear God, when you're a little older, you start to search for God, when you get a little older still, you find out you are God. Right. 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 And that's... That's My Catholic school upbringing never taught me that, but I know that. <laughs> no, I was because I was seeking I was seeking alternate viewpoints. Right. That's how I came across mm -hmm. that. But that's the ultimate mental health battle, isn't right. it? Right. Because again, everything is externalized. Right. There are people who are struggling, everything is coming at them. Everything is a threat. Everything is right. external. Right. And the fact that perceptively, that, yes. Right. But they give up their own their own internal power, which is ultimately very powerful. Exactly, and yeah. so. Well, and I, and I, th so that's, I, you know, going back to when people get turned off by, you know, oh, this, you know, the first step, giving it over to God. So the, it's not, 
God as in religious. It's not spiritual in the way that Don't they have the phrase behind it, however you... However, what's the phrase? However you... Uh, oh, you're going to ask me that? Yeah. Um, however They use you, God or whatever that means to you is essentially... Means, yeah, right. Yeah. So when I talk to people about it, I when I use that phrase, I say it's the energy you find within yourself that you can look to in the world. So it's, you know, if your energy from the earth, if that you have to go sit by the ocean and feel recharged for 20 minutes and that right. gives you that, that's your higher power. So that it becomes more tangible because when you put it out there that it's this ethereal thing or it's like, you know, you know, many people have such a bad relationship with religion yeah. that that takes away. So in this case, can't it's understand really, why. But right, <laughs> it's a whole other story. Oh boy, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna have that. That's a conversation for the also for the Plum Island conversation okay. after the yeah. show. All right. yeah. Yeah, all <laughs> um, yeah, all access. All access after the show. Yeah. Your daily the game scenes. face. Um, but uh, so going back to, I think the point of diminished returns yeah. for people to use in their own lives, and you can tell me if you think I'm right, is the point where. Um, you can't modulate it, meaning that you have problems at home and they're bothering you at work. You have problems at work and they're bothering you at home. Right. You can't sleep because you're dealing with these problems. You're giving up quality time with your family and your kids and happy times because this stuff is always coming in on you and you're dealing with it during those times. It's your, because, listen, everybody has anxiety, especially about you may be a work problem. Right. When you go home at night, you should be able to say, well, I'll tackle that tomorrow morning. Right, but people don't do that because they yeah. bring it home with them. Well, so that's one. Of, so I, I I have a, a eight eight tip li list which Ooh, I won't go through. Yeah. I won't go through all eight today. Okay. But there's one of the tips on the list when people say to me, "What's one thing I can do to make myself less anxious?" You know, at home, and I've used this a lot for the pandemic year. Is that so many people are home, mm -hmm. and they're home. Yeah. And they're home. And they're home. And home is work, and work is home, and and so to that point, it's. And the whole world is a threat. Well, right, yeah. and so, and but within the home, they're working. So, for example, I have I have a client that works from home, and one of her problems is is that she, for the longest time, was she'd come out of her one little space where she was working, and she has kids, and then the the child who's a child, and I would have to say, she's six. Yeah. I'd, I'd look at her and I'd say, she's six. And she'd be like, mommy, can I have a glass of something? And my client would yell at her. Yeah. And she felt guilty about yelling, and you know, I can't. And I said to her, I said, you're threat generating because you're taking your stress from the job that's in your house and you're not yeah. separating it out that when you walk outside of the door of the little space you're using as your office, that your family, your home is there too. So you have to shift. Right. So that, so we had to practice this technique back and forth of, we had to redesignate a work area. So that, and we put a line, a, t a piece of tape on the ground yep. that was like office. Love it. And then I had her put yeah. a, a piece of tape on the other side of that so that when she crossed over, it said home. So that she knew visually that it wasn't, she, her daughter was allowed to ask her for something. If she stepped out into the world of home, she had to bring her anxiety down. No matter how hard it was, she had to convert that this is home right so she had to go and leave the home to go to the bathroom or she, or she had to go to leave the office to go to the bathroom she was in the home area so she had to dedicate that she would not bring her anxiety over and then yell at her daughter forget it that's when. building the ability of modulating her anxiety right. and right. compartmentalizing it i remember i did a show years ago and i was talking for some reason it was a daily show so i brought a lot of guests and we were talking about chakras for some reason, and I made the offhand comment to her. We were talking about emotions. I made the offhand comment, well, you can't control how you feel. And she said, oh, wait a second. That's, yeah. And, and she said, look, you and your wife are walking along the road with your young child, and you're fighting, and you're really into it, and you're going at each other really hard, right? And you're angry, and everything's going on. And then all of a sudden, you hear tires screech. What happens? Was, I'm checking to see where the kid is. Yeah. Right? And she goes, yeah, your emotions shift instantly. You have every power to shift your emotions. Exactly. It's all within you. It's not external. No. And this is, you know, that point of crossing that line in between her quote-unquote office and being a mother. Yes. She has total control over that, but we don't understand we have total control right. over that. Because we're so used to just everything just gets blob together that that you don't you have to you have to be mindful there's that the might awareness be a, might be one of the great lessons of this pandemic because a lot of people had their worlds compressed Combined. together yes yeah right and, and which also accounts for a side topic which accounts for domestic violence went up yeah child abuse went up drinking and drugging went up overdoses went up death went up. so i mean so that's the downside of of this around that but the other side is being able to actually 
because lots of people are going to stay at home and work, so they've had to figure out how to not kill their children. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and, and be miserable and become alcoholics, you mm-hmm. know, seriously. Yeah, so, no, yeah. Um, I mean, that's been a hot topic all year from, I can't tell you how many people in my practice is like, you know, it's kind of like a lot of the, I have a, I have a set of women that all know each other that somehow because of their work in AA, they all found me over the past like decade. Yep. So they, they all share a lot of the stories together. And I often will hear from varieties of like how they've all, they've all had to learn to modulate yeah. because if well, not, a, they're going to go right back into their addiction. That's a great r- rudimentary exercise in modulating because right. you say, look, when I'm in my office and, and people kind of do that because they struggled in this pandemic about doing work at home. Right. Everybody struggled with it. The kids have to struggle with right. it, right? They have to right. be, their bedroom has to be a classroom, right. you know, all of a sudden and right. you have to get in a different mindset, but it's a great way to practice that because once you practice that, you get better at it. And once you get better at it and understand the benefits of it, right. you start doing it more and more, more and, and more and more. Right. It's like, okay, I can deal with that tomorrow. But it has to, well, it has I'm going to have dinner with, with my kid now. Right. It has to do with the patience level too, that you have yeah. to, all, there's so many little aspects that you have to start to apply that you wouldn't typically do but now it's right in your face to have to practice that and i think there's been a lot of good that's come out of being stuck at home with people and you know some of the bad but there's a lot of good because people have had to practice that and you know and and how many times i've had to point out like to parents talking about their kids like oh they that you know they they complain about having to be online well you just spent your hour talking to me about how you were complaining about being online Yep. And not realizing that the kids are doing the same thing and they're frustrated and you're frustrated and, and how, you know, and th- unfortunately there's still that stigma of like, yeah, but they're kids. They have nothing to worry about. Kids, that's not Ooh, fair to say. Yeah, that's not true at all. Um, that's not true at all. I, I cringe when I hear that. I was raised that way and my parents, I can't, I lost track. If I had a dollar for every time my <laughs> mother and father would say, you're seven, what do you have to be stressed about? And I will never forget that because thinking, well, I had a lot to be stressed about, yeah. which is a whole nother story, right? But but kids do, and when parents say, you have nothing to be stressed about, you're a kid, you have, it's, no, they, there's, it, and it doesn't matter about whether it was 30 years ago or today, it's still the same, there's stress, and it's just different stressors and in different shapes and sizes, but they're still there, it's so valid. So if you're feeling stress as an adult, your kid is certainly gonna be feeling stress during this time, and anxiety and anxiousness and all those pieces. Yep. Um, and being able to really manage that and going back to that division of m- the tip is, you know, shutting off the switch of I'm not at work. Therefore, the work stuff can't transfer over. So that you're not bringing and I think you said like work home and homework. You yeah. know? So you're you're actually dividing it out. So you're not threat generating that my child asking me for water or lunch is you know, after my boss just needed something done and I'm being pressed because everyone's pressing on me and now it's my child getting yelled at and getting the the reaction that the boss should be getting, yeah. but the child's getting him. So it's taking the brunt and how the impact of that has on kids down the line because that creates anxiety. So, you know. And the problem with deciphering this is that sometimes those things are real. In other words, sure. sometimes you're being pressed at work right. and you're being pressed at home. You, you know, your daughter wants a sandwich. And you get a report that's got to be done by 2 o'clock. Sometimes that's real, but it's not always real. Right, And exactly. being able to identify those times. And, again, if you're having a stressed time at work, working from home, quote-unquote, and your daughter wants a sandwich, the ability to set everything down for 20 minutes and make her a sandwich is key that's so important. Because right. once you learn that ability, you apply it everywhere. Right. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and that's the thing is being able to apply it everywhere. It's, you know, people often come in and want fixes for each of their each of their scenarios and i say no we're going to do one it's the same and fix. it covers the yeah. whole thing. it's the same fix <laughs> and then they'll ask yeah. me and, and that's fine we'll do it until they realize you know they'll say but what about this scenario I'm like we're still and then we walk it through and until the person finally realizes oh it is the same thing to keep doing and understanding and 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 putting the same technique on this um and it's not you know people are like oh it's so difficult You worked hard to get into the position to be the anxiety person that you are. You worked hard to get into the addiction that you're in. You worked hard to get depressed where you are. And that's not blaming. That's not shaming. That's about you co-created your internal environment with the factors that coexist with it. So if you worked hard to do that, you certainly can work hard to get out of it. And then it becomes automatic because when you're an addict in full-blown addiction, 
It comes very easy to you. If you're anxious, you don't have to think about it. It just comes to you. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, and you can say that for, you know, if you're overweight and you're an overeater, you don't think about it. You just do it. Right? So, to do the reverse and unlearn what you've learned, then you learn something new to replace it. And that's, it's the same. If you can learn one thing, you can learn another. It's, it's funny a matter how, of want. For me personally, how that came was when I'm, the turning point, for me, I can't remember a turning point. It was just all of a sudden I realized one day I was handling things totally differently. You know, it's like, right. oh, okay, that, that would have freaked me out before. Well, it's like what <laughs> I've said before about like people that say, oh, you're an overnight success. Ten years. <laughs> right it's yeah because on the surface to you or other people it look like oh it happened because all of a sudden it happened but it didn't it, yeah. it was a lot of work that went into becoming whatever it is that you are at this moment good bad or indifferent yeah it doesn't just happen you don't just fluke it. end up you, know, you don't fluke end up as a full-blown person in addiction you don't end up full-blown anxiety panic disorder all of a sudden right. even though people will say it just happens. I don't know why. I'm not thinking anything. That's my favorite line. I'm not thinking anything. I'm like, oh, actually, you're thinking a lot. Yep. You just are totally unaware of what you're thinking. Um, and you can see the frustration of people having to look at because what's happened is the brain has built a compartmentalized guard wall against actually looking at the things that are the threat generation actually for real. It's just now become automatic. It's, it's a constant tape playing that the person just... The only time I think people tend to be aware of it that I hear about is they lay down in bed and start yeah. to go to sleep. And then yep. it's racing thoughts and jumping around. And I, you know, I'm planning for the, what's going to happen three weeks from now. Right. What if this doesn't happen? And what if I can't pay that bill or whatever? And all it does is just create more. And if you don't have control of the thing right in the moment, then what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. It's that's not going to help you. That's the key. That's the one of the key lessons is that if you're laying in bed at night and you're worried about, you know, going to your parents' house for Christmas dinner three weeks from now, what can you do with it about it right now? Right. You know, so why are you why are you dealing with it? Like exactly. that anxiety will be there tomorrow. Yeah. And it'll be there, you know, right. the next day. For now, let's set it down and go to sleep. Well, and oftentimes people will say, "Well, I'm planning." I'm planning. I'm like, well, what are you really? planning for? Yeah. You're planning for doomsday. You're planning for, the, for yeah. like, what's the worst case scenario? What's going to happen? Well, we're going to get in a huge fight. Well, you getting in a huge fight three weeks from now isn't going to be today. So you anticipating it and putting yourself on the inverted you over on the over, over anxiety side is going to make your outcome of the day really poor because you're anticipating, you're bringing in a self fulfilling prophecy and it's more likely going to mm -hmm. push it that direction because you're ready on top of that you turn that one bad afternoon into a month's worth of work right exactly you, know, it just, you tortured yourself for a month with it right yes and mm -hmm. i have many clients the holidays are you know holidays are always yeah. a where i have clients that are already planning for christmas right now because for those for the stress reasons of i have to see this person or i have to do this and i'm like we're seven months away <laughs> and i'm like seven you're gonna miss the whole summer you're going to miss all the great things that are happening because you're worried about, like, sitting at the table with Aunt Sally or for, mother. For me now, it's fighting interactions and my triggers because mm -hmm. I, I have triggers. And then what you have to discern is how much of this is really an offense. And, how, you know, I'm using the word loosely, offense. Right. right. And how much of it is you just being triggered by something. Right. In other words, can you – because when you're interacting with other people – what they think they're saying and doing is totally different from what it is that's triggering you. Yes. Right? Exactly. It doesn't mean the same thing to them. Right. But Or it's innocuous to them. It's innocuous to them. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, wow, I just had that this morning. <laughs> Not it's here. like you get insulted by somebody or you take something really personally. It's like yes. they weren't talking about you at all. Exactly. They weren't thinking about you at all. Right. Exactly. But, but it touched your stuff. It, it, it just triggered you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I know. I mean, and there's so many different ways to get triggered. And, and that's the thing is what happens in anxiety. And we'll do, well, we're talking about anxiety today, but in anxiety, it's, it's, it's trigger first that leads to the thought, that leads to the feeling, mm -hmm. that leads to the action and reaction, that leads to the cycle back to the trigger, to the thought, right? right. And it becomes a vicious cycle because you ruminate on the trigger. And if the trigger doesn't go away or you don't know how to modulate the trigger to change the thought, which will immediately change the feeling. You don't have to change your feeling. The thought is the what you have to change. Right. So you have to generate a perspective that's rational, realistic, and reasonable. And that the rest of the cycle will stop. But it's 
people try to control for the trigger, control for the thought, not change it, and then the feeling just gets increasingly more intense, which makes the outcome behavior, whatever right. it is, more. But you can be on Plum Island and get a comment, for example. Uh, <laughs> right. We're going there. And it's like, uh, well, not specifically, but it's yeah, a good example of it. Oh, you're so going there. You, you can be on Plum Island and get a comment, and it can trigger you, and you can take it very personally, and you can just grind on it. <laughs> for several days tell you, the story. Yes. Yeah. you can grind on it for several days but isn't that giving way more energy to this than it deserves yes because even if i didn't the, say i was perfect i know i know I understand. <laughs> because even if the person meant it it's like what does it mean to you though i mean it's, it's like why why are we giving see i've become as i've gotten older i've got very protective of my mental energy yes it's like i'm just not going to give this to that well, so in the case that I'm not going to discuss on air, <laughs> in the case, I have gotten very good at protecting the mental energy around it. But because yeah. you live on Plum Island, I know it's going to be a very entertaining story because you're yeah. going to totally understand. Oh, I can anticipate it and, totally. Yeah. And it's, you're going to be like, of course this is how, you know, yeah. but, and, and you'll know it because you know me, you'll know why it triggered me Yeah. because, you know, but it also, the whole thing is for, for mine and, and everyone doesn't have to know the backstory on this, but. I get triggered in a generated way to be competitive. Therefore, mine doesn't go down a diminished returns thing. It uh, goes into... <laughs> yeah, it goes into hyperdrive. It, it goes into, <laughs> how can I get better, bigger, faster, stronger, and make it even yeah. more? It's almost like you're Sicilian. So, so and, it's, and it's so much fun. And then, you know, on the backside, I've got John being like, you're out of control. I'm like, I can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> Hence, I have to get a bigger lens. <laughs> <laughs> I have to spend $2,000 more on a bigger lens. At yeah. which point, Bill, who's listening to me today, says, you don't need a new lens. Well, he didn't say that. I think he said, yes, you can get a new lens. But he said, you need a new body of the camera. Because my I don't want to oh, give I up see. my... I have a Canon. It's old and I love it. And I just don't want to give it up. But anyway. <laughs> don't give it up. Just buy another one. Oh, and okay. use both of them, and I then think eventually you give that to me as a Christmas present now. <laughs> Body of a Christmas camera in July. Yeah. So oh, anybody like that it. wants to fund my very nice 500 millimeter f-stop PF Nikon that I would really like, that would be fantastic. <laughs> it's only like eight thousand dollars. So I guess we were talking about the first step of awareness of dealing with anxiety, which is is it is it is it a problem? It's kind of like the first step of addiction. Do I have a problem? Um, Do I have a problem with anxiety? So the answer to that would be it's whether to the degree of how it impacts your functioning yeah is it is it functionally impairing you and if it is then yes and i would say if your anxiety is creeping into other situations where it's not necessary right that's a pretty good sign yes because sometimes people aren't aware that it's functionally impairing them so yeah you, you should know. be at home having dinner with your family as opposed to being really cranked up about what happened at work today right exactly for an example right yeah right exactly yeah. and 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 I was just thinking about all the different scenarios of like, you know, having the functional thing. Oh, not you know, going after your partner if after someone said something that offended you. Right, exactly. <laughs> Otherwise. Exactly. On Plum Island. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We just can't wait for the story. He's I been waiting I'm for an hour now. to hear the story. Yeah. He's going to know the outcome already, so. Yeah. And then he can reference it next week. <laughs> but anyway, I have no idea what I was going to say because you keep going to Plum Island and it makes me cuckoo. Yeah. So, um. I was gonna. Oh, that's the why it's fun. The functional, the functional. <laughs> you're so awful. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! The functional impairment piece is oftentimes things that are at, like you wouldn't necessarily know. Functional impairment is insomnia. Yeah. Um, waking up multiple times at night for whatever reason. You know, you get sleep anxiety disorder. Sure. That's actually a thing. Um, uh, mindlessly eating just stay you know going into the kitchen and opening the fridge just because you're there and keep going like yeah. that kind of thing that lethargy was, those are things that yeah. are signs that you're functionally being impaired by anxiety um and there's many of them i mean i could generate a list heightened of anger um Agitation, transferring anger leth lethargy road rage yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> it's just i was born and raised in massachusetts just the way it is oh god yes <laughs> So anyway, well, I hope that everyone... That's something I passed on to my daughter, by the way. Which, uh, road rage? Yeah. Well, oh. not road rage, but I'm just educating other drivers on what they should be doing. Oh, how, while I'm how driving. kind of you. <laughs> exactly. How kind of you. Not externally, just in, mm. just sitting there in the driver's seat. Okay. We all do it. You do it, too. Don't tell me what I do. <laughs> I do not. 
Anyway, so um, hopefully this was helpful for people. Yeah. I had a couple other things I was going to talk about, but we didn't get to that today. But that's all right, because this was a big question last week. Um, but we will be having a great conversation next week. Please keep sending your questions, and I will answer them as they come in. And thank you so much, and have a fantastic week, you guys. And please go back and listen to all my other podcasts on your daily game face on all your favorite podcast channels. Thank you.